So yes, I'm uh, John O'Donovan, I, I'm the CTO of the Financial Times. Uh, I'm going to give you a few examples and case studies of how I've uh, used uh, Node. And, but I tend to think of it as, in, as part of a, a framework. So there are certain things that have changed in technology, which I'm also going to explain about where, where and why Node is hot at the moment and why it fits really well with both with a microservices architecture and why it works well in the cloud and why it helps, uh, why it fits so well into uh, a modern approach to some of the things we used to do. So I think it's worth remembering some of the stuff we used to do. So this was what systems used to look like and you would say, well, what does this system do? And you'd get a list of interfaces that would tell you pretty much nothing about what's going on inside. These sort of big monolithic systems is, is uh, it's the sort of stuff that uh, my team enjoy ripping down and throwing in the river these days. You know, the, the, the enterprises are full of this stuff. It's like a curse. Uh, big, old monoliths um, which aren't well documented. No one really knows what's going on inside. And uh, they tend to be running on Solaris as well, which is just for that added, added extra spice. You can only buy some Solaris servers on eBay now, by the way. It's a big second-hand market. So that you have these huge problems that you're trying to deal with. So you're trying to modernize and move forward in a, in a sensible way. So this is something worth remembering. It's not a good thing to do. And uh, technology only has itself to blame for its past sins. And it's really lucky the rest of the business don't know that these were bad decisions. But uh, you know, th these are things that we need to remember not to do. So we should talk about them. Other stuff we, we used to do. So you think about um, a microservices architecture has a very different view of uh, what's important. So this is stuff. Uh, you may, uh, some of you may remember the sort of the sort of guy who would run around talking about his server that's been running for two and a half thousand days and how proud he was of that server. Um, it's uh, it's never failed. It's been running forever, and the only thing he's terrified of is if he ever has to actually patch it. He has no idea if that is coming back at all, <laughs> ever, because this uh, no, this is this is a proper horror. Right? This is stuff you should never do anymore. Um, so when you think about uh, node and technologies like that in a, in a services architecture, you're constantly rebuilding, rebooting, refreshing. You have so when we we had problems with uh, things like shell shock and heart bleed and bugs, uh, we weren't at all bothered. We we know we can bring our architecture back up really quickly because we're constantly doing it. Um, these are things that change the way you think about architecture as well. So servers that have uh, have been given names and are running for many many years that you should go and hunt those down as well. Um, and you really want to get rid of some of the complexity which has been built into architecture. So you have big monolithic systems that are also talking to other big monolithic systems. And you end up with lots of pieces sitting outside that, lots of translation and uh, wrappers in order to try and control these things. Um, now, generally, when I talked about cloud and I think about how some of these things work, you know, a lot of the time we do like to try and let cloud vendors worry about some of the complexity of running the infrastructure and running the things that allow you to scale. So those are things worth remembering. Um, I'll come back to some of those points. Um, so why do we like Node.js? So we, there are lots of things we like about it. I thought I'd pick out a few things that I think really are, uh, really are valuable. The, the event-driven nature is really fantastic for us. It, a lot of the stuff we do is very event-driven when we publish or when we have requests or when we move data around. We have a huge data science team. We look at lots of data. We have lots of market data, lots of events firing all the time. Um, Node really works well in that model and it allows us to build quite a, quite a simple way of dealing with these things. You know, you, you're, the asynchronous nature of it means you, you can have lots of events firing, lots of stuff going on and it, it scales nicely. So talking about scaling, so this is George the cat. So George has a level of cuteness. He's quite cute, but he, you know, if I made him bigger and bigger, he stops being cute. He's, he's no longer a cute cat anymore. He becomes some scary monster. The thing that is important around horizontal scaling, if you put this in the view of systems, what is really nice is things that scale horizontally. So no matter how cute George is, he will never be as cute as his 10 brothers all at the same time. So horizontal scaling is nice because when you think about how you how you used to build things, you would spend a lot of time uh, optimizing code and thinking about code. Uh, and often you would have developers who would spend weeks, months trying to optimize something to run faster. Horizontal scaling is, is a very different way of thinking. And as, as a background <laughs> as an engineer, it's almost, uh, it's almost horrible in a way because you build it 
And if it's not running fast enough, you fire up another one. And if it's not running fast enough, you fire up another one. And it's only at the point where, you know, and that may, that may sound terrible, but if you're doing that in the cloud, that extra one is costing me, you know, 10p a day or something. You know, it's, it's costing nothing to run more of them. So uh, on a cost-benefit analysis, you, you start to think differently about what you need the code to do. And actually having you know, shared nothing architectures which are uh, able to scale horizontally is, is really powerful. And Node fits into that really well for us. That's another key advantage. And, and skill sets. I think George mentioned skill sets. Um, it's very easy to find people who are uh, good JavaScript developers. Um, there are lots of them. And they are. Uh, no, JavaScript developers are, are not the web developers of old. You know, um, some of you probably are JavaScript developers, but uh, for those that, but we have a, a team called FT Labs and a, a number of other very high-end um, uh, JavaScript and uh, front-end skill sets. And those guys talk. They talk like game developers. They talk about refresh rates. They talk about you know how quickly they can move things between uh, between refresh in the browser and what they need to do in order to to keep that experience moving smoothly. We, we've got probably still one of the few uh, really high-end web apps, which um, once it's running, I would challenge anyone to tell it's not a native app, on, uh, uh, and it's all built out of this sort of view of building really high-end code. So, so we, we care about this stuff, and we find it easy to find people who understand this. It's not that you can't find people who know Java or other languages, but it's actually much easier to, you know, at a general level, it's fairly easy to find a, a good level of JavaScript developers. And that's important because when you want to scale up and down, that makes a difference. Um, so how does this fit in with microservices? So tying this together with microservices, I, I, I think that people talk about scalability and they talk about how, how you can build things to scale. But quite simply, the only thing that scales architecturally is simplicity. That is the only thing, regardless of language, of technique, of pattern, whatever you do, the only thing that really scales is simplicity. And I'll show you in one of the examples. So you, know, you think about the brick and you think about things that scale well. They are based on very simple, unbreakable principles. Um, you also think about how you do things uh, in a complicated system and what's going on. So, Again, Node fits well into a microservices architecture. You build small amounts of code, things that uh, there's no sort of rule on what a microservice should look like, but generally it should just be doing one thing. And when you have lots of these things that are um, built together and working together, you have quite a loosely and well abstracted architecture, which can, uh, it's very easy to manage and fix. And it does drive good development. So when you think about um, microservices, it's, you know, things aren't hidden away in your system. You have the horror of peer review on everything you do. And there is no architectural mandate that I can set which will be more horrifying than a peer review of code that is not up to standard. You know, the uh, developers are ruthless. They love finding stuff that someone's done wrong. So, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no architectural board I could set up that would more effectively manage the architecture than having a very open services view where the code, the, co the amount of code is quite small. You can open up a service, have a look at it, see what it's doing, and you can optimize it. Um, that does drive good behavior. It's, it's sort of a, it, it's not a, an obvious benefit of, of using Node and using microservices, but it does drive good behavior because people are, um, they're compelled to do stuff better. If they write a function within a large program, they do it in a certain way. When they're writing a, a service and it's going to be publicly available, they just they just care more about how that will be viewed by their peers. And um, I mentioned it's easy to manage, so um, we find that this architecture works well. But it also it creates a opportunity to manage things well. So you can think about updates. To exa for example, if you've got lots and lots of endpoints and one of them needs a new version of uh, of a, a service or a new version of a of a language, you can update just that one. You don't have to update everything. You can actually think about how you use, um, George mentioned as well, you can use different code, you can use different languages. It all fits together quite nicely. So I'm going to give you an example of how, how microservices and um, Node work really well. So this was uh, the uh, Olympics architecture, which I built at a previous company. Um, and it was based on having to scale so, so you've got these huge problems. It's the biggest event going on in the world. Everyone's looking at it. Um, it must scale to outrageous proportions because everyone was using the, the uh, Olympics API. 
and uh, you only need it for three weeks, so don't go crazy and spend lots of money because afterwards we don't need it and it needs to disappear. So how, you know, solving that problem was quite a difficult one. And we started off with one solution and then we changed midway towards this solution as we um, looked at the options we had and thought how we were going to scale as things became more complicated and more and more people started using the API. We could see it was going to have trouble scaling. So um, we, we built um, a service which I'll talk you through. So in the bottom left, we, we used a system called MarkLogic as a database, just a very high performance um, NoSQL database that could handle complex queries. And we put Nginx in front of that. That didn't seem to be enough. So we then went and uh, talked to Mashery as an API gateway. And we told them the sort of numbers we were looking at of, you know, we needed to be able to cope with 100,000 transactions a second plus. Now, we didn't actually know how big it was going to be, but we knew it could easily get to that level. And you could tell by the look on their faces as well, they were a bit scared of that number because they hadn't done anything that big either. So we needed to think about, well, how, how, do, we, how do we scale it further? So the main opportunity that we took was to scale into the cloud. So we actually did use Windows Azure this year because the, um, the IS plugin for Node was built in and uh, was very effective. Um, and this was probably the first really, really big thing that was built in that technology. It was all very new when we found it. Um, and what was great about this, so the mastery component was then um, managing keys and APIs, uh, API gateway, basically. So it was managing access and control of uh, clients. Um, but the Node.js layer, which was managing the endpoints, scaled horizontally uh, as far as we wanted. We could fire stuff up and down. It, um, it never failed us, and it was incredibly, uh, incredibly powerful. You know, it, it, uh, it, it was the, the worry we had when we started was knowing how much capacity we needed, but, and the capability to, to do something that is, is quite simple, but what we were able to do also is make more complex endpoints by using no combinations of queries, so you could chain queries across endpoints and start to build up more complex queries. So all sorts of things that were good about it. But the main thing was, it was uh, very simple to build, very simple to manage, and just scaled effortlessly. And that's um, probably the start of a, a small affair with Node.js, because it started to look like a really good solution for these problems. Um, so as I said, it does force you to think differently. So you're not optimizing single monolithic code blocks anymore. You are fitting into an architecture where you are trying to scale in a way that's slightly different. You're trying to build things that are working as asynchronous as possible, but are also able to chain and work together in a, in a services architecture. Now, the, there are some problems with this. You do find that you can build a house of cards of services which are all calling one another, and that can be quite difficult to debug and quite difficult to test. But overall, it works much better than the other options we had. So the main thing is, is that this was a change in direction for us, but um, never be scared of changing direction and thinking differently. You know, these, these things felt quite new and it felt quite scary, but actually, as soon as you tried it out and tested it, it looked very solid. So I'll give you some examples of how we're using it now. So we now build our entire front-end framework. It's, it, our in, a framework is called Origami, and um, uh, Andrew Betts, who's our director of FT Labs, <coughs> just presented this at Velocity about how it works. And it uses Node to uh, build services. It uh, has a, a front-end components, which are um, resources built in CSS and HTML. And it uses JavaScript and uh, Node.js at the back end as well to, uh, to effectively coordinate the communication between the front-end and the services at the back end. Um, it's, it has a heavy reliance on uh, Package Manager and on using uh, Node.js in order to build out services because it just was the quickest way to share skill sets across the front and back end. So that it's one of the things that was always a promise of being able to use the same skill sets in the browser and at the back end. It doesn't quite work as beautifully as that, but it does allow you to share a, a very common code base so you can decide and we, make, we can make decisions now around whether we pre-render things on the server or whether we push them to the browser. And you can change that decision at more or less any point and decide whether or not you want to, uh, which way you want to approach a problem. So it gives us a lot of flexibility. And um, <coughs> we, we find that it's just been uh, very flexible for people. They've, they've been able to build lots of services. They really engage with it. They're using it across the site. And it's been able to um, improve the way we service our 
our website and other uh, other products we have sitting around, uh, you know, real time data and uh, and so on. So we use it extensively there, and we also use Node within our within our architecture. So this is a as always in a, a presentation on technical things, you should have a slide that isn't quite visible uh, with lots of boxes and lines on, so here it is. Um, but basically this is um, what was previously one big block that used to take three months to deploy. Uh, and I'm not joking, it was, it was so complicated. It was the, the content stack which could easily break the website. So this is now broken down into services, lots of small tasks being performed by small services which are all uh, communicating uh, so to avoid some of the orchestration problems, we use Kafka. Um, but when you think about um, where this all leads you, you do start to think in a very event-driven way, which is where Node fits so well around how these applications work. We also use Java and DropWizard within this, and we use, um, we're experimenting a bit with Go. But those, um, these type of uh, architectures are much easier to manage and much cleaner, and uh, we've, we've had a lot of success with it. It allows us to move much faster. So in summary, um, the things that we really like about Node and the things that have worked well for me, it's, it's simple, it's scalable, and it's successful at delivering the things I've asked it to do. Um, and you get, a, you get a satisfaction from that. You, you, can, uh, you often find um, a lot of projects in the past where you feel like you've hauled things over the line with a lot of pain. You know, there's been a lot of joy in using Node where things just sort of work. People say the same thing about Ruby as well. You know, some, the way it works just feels right and it's, uh, it's something which we um, enjoy working with. So for lots of reasons um, uh, it's a good language to use. We found some of our Java devs have moved over to using JavaScript and they've become multi-skilled in that way as well. So all of that is, uh, is a really good model for us. So those are some examples of uh, how I've used it and some examples of how we're using it now and what we want to do with it in the future. And I, I think one of the things to think about, as I said, is thinking about Node within, a, within an ecosystem, so within a services framework. So you don't have to do microservices, but microservices do have some interesting uh, benefits. Um, and think about how it works, not just in your, your own infrastructure, but how it works in the cloud, because Node is very cloud friendly. It um, allows you to uh, make best use of the cloud. And if you think about some of Amazon's recent announcements, so stuff like Lambda, I was at the uh, AWS reInvent event uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and Lambda's very interesting. So Lambda allows you to basically deploy code into AWS without any VMs, without any infrastructure. You just deploy code. And when an event is triggered, it will run the code. And you only get charged when the code actually runs. So all of the issues around how you manage code, it's, it's an incredible, I think it's only just starting to settle how big a change that could be to how people have managed uh, infrastructure and thought about provisioning. It completely changes that model and it changes the cost model. And the thing that fits in the middle of that really well is Node. That's why they've um, made that you know, the, the key element of looking at um, how Lambda would work is based on an event-driven model which uh, fits really well with JavaScript and Node and that's why they've used it. So I think the, when you think about where it could go, I think there's an awful lot of potential to, uh, to yet be fulfilled. And it, as uh, George said, it's quite a young language. So um, that's me done. Yeah, I've got a question regarding more the front end part of your um, services and applications. Yeah. Um, so one of, how do you solve the problem of having different, uh, basically formalizing the description of the UI on the different platforms? So I assume you will have some um, CSS and HTML frameworks that you use on the web end, but then that, how does that translate also to the mobile applications and how do you kind of keep that more maintainable and is there any sort of special modules or frameworks you use that aren't your own? Yes, so the reason for us moving to, um, to origami is how we want to manage things consistently. So in the past we've had, um, and many, uh, many companies have had this problem, there, the, there's vertical stacks that deliver to different platforms. So you have a native app that's built on a stack. We have a HTML5 app, the web app we have, which is built on a stack. There's a mobile site that's built on a stack. There's a desktop stack. Uh, you know, the, these things are, uh, are what we're trying to align. So, we, I mean, there, there are various uh, 
uh, ways of describing how you look at development and look at mobile first and other things. I mean, we're very much API first. So what we care about is being universal and being able to publish in a consistent way. So we think about the services and the API, and then what we want to do is be able to then consistently build components which will run on, uh, on different platforms, or we also are building a routing mechanism that allows us to choose whether or not we use component A, B, or C on, in, particular, um, in particular scenarios, which is, again, uh, Node.js built. So we have these, um, uh, the, the capability we're moving towards is having a more consistent, uh, a more consistent architecture, but actually more flexibility and components at the front end. And that works if you think about, think about it from an API point of view. So if everything's built on APIs, you care less about how individual pieces work on top of the API. The whole point of the API is to free up capability to do things. So yeah. we've, we're probably approaching it in, in that way and thinking about how we, um, not about building one single framework. The, um, so Origami is, is available to look at on the web. You can, it's open source, you can go and use it. Um, it's something which uh, has various tools for templating and managing how you, how you can build on different platforms. But um, we've, the, the problem of trying to get the web app working and making HTML5 actually work you know, you know, in, really, um, in the, some of the things it doesn't do as well as it should, like local storage and uh, all of those issues, um, uh, we've basically decided you know, that a, a, a component framework which is flexible, rather than trying to make one thing run everywhere, it's better to think about APIs and components which can plug in. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> right. You talked about some microservices. You had that great big diagram of all those different components. Yeah. How would they run? Are they run individually, or is there one node instance running that's just sort of routing in between them? So they're all um, different pieces. Some of it's Node, some of it's um, uh, Java, um, and uh, there are other things there. I mean, they're. they're um, the main thing is it's thinking, uh, so, so nodes infected people in thinking in a microservices way. So even when they're not building a node, they're thinking in a, uh, a nodey way. I can't think of a better way of saying it. Uh, so, so they're thinking about asynchronous uh, and stateless uh, communication. So where, where you're trying to um, remove dependencies between um, the way that you would used to do these things, where you'd have APIs and endpoints that needed to know state and needed to be constantly um, uh, managing the state through an entire life cycle of a message. You're actually thinking differently about how you can push messages out and fire and forget them. So the, the, the main reason, uh, or the, the main way we do that is we, we do use Kafka as, as the coordination mechanism in the middle and then the different services are as, as small and as, uh, as stateless as possible around that. So they will, so they will all work. Possibly, they're not all necessarily in the same VM, they're not all necessarily in the same language, but um, Node hasn't just, uh, it isn't just a tool, it's, it's uh, God, this sounds cheesy, it's like a way of life. You start, uh, okay, yeah, don't, don't quote that. Uh, but, because, um, uh, yeah, I'll get, I'll, get, I'll get ribbed for that tomorrow. Uh, but um, the thing that is, um, the thing that's good about it is it does make you think in an asynchronous way, and that's actually been one of the best things about it. Um, do you use anything like Docker, or are you planning to? Yeah, so we, we do use Docker a little bit. We haven't used it as, as much as we possibly could. We found um, uh, over the last uh, six months, there's been a number of, th of developments that you could very easily just pivot into because Docker... Um, so, so Docker is... Uh, sort of <laughs> what's interesting about um, virtualization, so I've described this to a few people this way, so virtualization is is sort of a hardware guy's view of what developers want, and Docker is actually a software guy's view of what developers want in terms of how they want to deploy things. And people have spent a lot of time trying to build hybrid clouds, that, uh, hybrid infrastructure that will work across multiple clouds, when actually the solution wasn't to do that at all. It's actually Docker is a much better way of managing and deploying things which you want to use in multiple environments. Um, and again, we work very closely with AWS, so we're very interested in how that works, because that's the closest thing to having Amazon in my data center is being able to use the Docker uh, tools they've built where you can run <coughs> things within a Docker container. Uh, in your data center, you can move it up into the cloud, you can move it back, you can uh, flexibly decide how you want to scale and where you want to scale. So we're very, um, yeah, very interested in Docker. It's a, it's a pretty, pretty good tool. Yeah, so, and we'll use it a lot more in the future, definitely. 
Uh, any more questions? Cool. Okay, so thank you.